Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are joining us from in the U.S. And I want to say an especially good morning from a sunny Brisbane, Queensland, Australia winter's day. So yes, it is officially winter um, down under. And I'm, I'm going to give you a little piece of homework. It's projected to get up to 25 degrees uh, Celsius here today, which is pretty typical for Brisbane winter's day. So following on the webinar, I encourage you to convert that into Fahrenheit because you will have to know Celsius when you come down under to study. My name is Cecile McGuire. I'm the Associate Director of North America for the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Queensland. And congratulations to all of you who received an offer to study at the University of Queensland next year. The presentation that we're going to um, show you today is going to be um, through my colleagues who work in the UQ International Missions Office. So Chase Hardy um, works in International Missions. He's going to walk you through how to accept your offer. And then our colleague, Rachel Keogh, you know, runs the financial aid office, and she'll talk to you more about U.S. financial aid and what you need to do to apply for U.S. financial aid. I'm going to turn over now to Chase Hardy to begin the presentation. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to second Cecile's sentiments and congratulate you on receiving an offer. Um, my name is Chase Hardy and I'm part of the UQ International Admissions Team that look after the admissions for this particular program. And today I'm just going to talk about some of the key requirements for accepting your offer, just to try and make it maybe a little bit more straightforward um, because there is a lot of information in the offer letter and I know sometimes it can be a little, there can be a lot of questions around it. So um, I guess the first thing to look at is the key acceptance requirements. Um, so there's really four bits of information um, that are key on your offer letter that will help you understand the process for finalizing your acceptance. Um, so on the first page, you'll find the initial payment um, or tuition deposit figure. Um, so this currently stands at $3,000 and is the amount that must be paid to secure your place in the program. So tuition must be paid. That fee is represented in US dollars and must be paid in US dollars. And then the other, I guess you could say, financial aspect is the overseas student health cover requirement. So all students who, or international students seeking to study in Australia, um, it's a condition of studying in Australia and of applying for a visa that you have suitable overseas health um, care requirements. So this must be arranged through UQ or an approved overseas health care, uh, overseas health care provider um, before your acceptance can be confirmed. And if you do choose to arrange your overseas health cover through UQ, um, the figure that's noted on your offer letter will be noted in Australian dollars. So that's just a distinction to remember and must be paid in Australian dollars as well. So the tuition deposit, again, is in US dollars and the overseas student health cover that is represented in Australian dollars. Um, the other important um, requirement, which will apply to some, um, is the offer conditions. So this is listed, I think, in the second or third page of your offer, and that will list any conditions which must be satisfied prior to your acceptance being confirmed. So generally speaking, these will be things like certified documents or any other entry requirements that have yet to be um, confirmed, um, which must be be satisfied before we can process your acceptance. Um, and then the final key piece of information there is the acceptance deadline. So this is the date by which you must accept your offer to secure a place. Now, for most offers that set, or all offers really, it's set at 21 days from the date of the offer issue. But it is just worth, I guess, mentioning that we are trying to be as flexible as possible uh, around that at the moment due to the current challenges that, you know, many people face with sourcing final documents or final results due to the current pandemic. Um, so, you know, that date is in there, but if you're not able to meet that date, just get in contact with us or the faculty and we can try and work with you to, to see what we can do. Um, thanks, Cecile. Can we have the next slide, please? 
So a little bit more on offer conditions. So these will basically just list any program entry requirements which have not been satisfied at the time of us issuing the offer. Um, and they'll be listed on the second or third page of your offer. So most commonly, these will include final academic transcripts, evidence of degree award, um, or evidence of meeting the, ang uh, the English language proficiency requirements. So with the academic transcripts, um, I guess these are most commonly included as conditions on your offer if you either are yet to receive your final transcript or if you have provided transcripts, uh, but they haven't been sufficiently certified. Um, so if we have received your final, there's a lot of situations where we've received your final transcripts and we've confirmed your GPA, but we're still just waiting for those certified copies. Now the important thing to remember about certified copies is a couple of things, is that we need certified copies of all of the transcripts that uh, contribute to the award of your final degree. So what we see a lot of, especially with the, um, the Oshna students is that you've often completed studies at two or three institutions that have been credited towards your final degree. So if you are submitting your final transcript, we also need to have certified copies of the transcript from your awarding institution, along with those from the other institutions where you've completed study, which we've then credit to, credited towards your degree. Um, the GPA requirements, uh, if it hasn't already, will be confirmed once you receive your final transcripts. Um, and there's a few ways you can meet the certification requirement for transcripts. So um, traditionally, what we've accepted is either original copies or copies which have been cited and certified as a true copy of the original document. So that's, you know, where you take them into a public notary with a copy and they look at both documents to ensure that they match um, and put a stamp on it to say um, that they've confirmed that and then that's submitted to us. Um, but more recently, what we see a lot more of is electronically certified documents, which we can also accept. So these are documents commonly um, which are requested through the transcript network and include electronic certification, which we can basically use to verify that the document is original and hasn't been um, altered at all and is a true, uh, a true document or electronic document which represents your academic performance. Um, evidence of degree award. So simply put, this would normally be your bachelor degree or your master's degree um, diploma. So we accept certified or original copies of your award certificate. Um, but if that's not able to be provided, we can also accept um, transcript notations, which confirm conferral of degree or a certified copy of an official degree completion letter issued by the awarding university. Um, where you've completed your studies. So uh, just to clarify on that, quite often, you know, your transcript once you've completed your studies will include a note um, which will say that, which will specify the degree you've completed and the date of the conferral. So if that's included in your transcript, generally that's acceptable and will meet both the transcript requirement and the evidence of degree award requirement. Um, but if you've, say, completed your studies, but that final transcript isn't ready or there's a, the timing doesn't quite work that way. You can also request a letter from your university that confirms degree completion, um, and that can be accepted as well, provided that it's certified. Um, most of the degree completion letters we receive from universities are acceptable, um, and most universities will already have a template in place that they use to issue that. But some, I guess, key bits of information that we like to see in there are just details about the program that was completed, and if possible, also the expected conferral date, so when they actually expect to issue you your final award certificate. Um, I guess the third most common um, condition that you might see in your offer would be the condition to meet the English language proficiency requirements. Um, so your offer may include this um, as required test results like IELTS or TOEFL, through which you can meet this requirement, but most commonly, this will be things like um, you providing your final evidence of degree award, and that's satisfying the English requirement because we can accept that to meet the English requirement in this case. Um, your conditions in the offer should also specify quite, quite clearly, um, in regards to your case, how you can meet English language requirements as well, uh, but that's the third 
condition, if it hasn't already been met, that has to be satisfied prior to your offer becoming what we term unconditional, uh, at which stage we can then process your acceptance. Um, there are other conditions that might apply in certain circumstances, but they are very rare, um, so probably not worth noting at the moment, but if you do see anything else on there, it should clearly specify what's required. And if you have any questions, please just feel free to contact us and we can walk you through it. Um, so I think that covers offer conditions. Cecile, um, would we be able to have the next slide, please? Excellent. So once you've read through your letter, reviewed the offer and met the conditions um, of the offer, then it's time to submit your acceptance. So you'll find that your offer includes two pages, which you will have to submit in order to finalize your acceptance. The first is the acceptance page, um, which basically asks you to agree to the terms and conditions of the offer, provide UQ with permission to conduct document authenticity checks, um, to provide UQ with permission to check visa status, and to confirm that you're applying for a student visa from overseas, and then of course the signature to um, sign your acceptance or confirm your acceptance of the offer. Um, in most cases, in practice, we have already conducted um, document authenticity checks by the time you've received an offer, um, but this is just an essential step, um, which is pretty much standard with all our acceptances at UQ. Um, the second page, which must be completed and submitted, is the payment details page, which normally follows after the acceptance page. And there you just confirm the method of payment, confirm your overseas health cover requirements and then provide payment details. So that's basically just explaining whether you're looking to pay by credit card or what method of payment you wish to use. So once we receive those two forms completed, then we will proceed to process your final, um, or to finalize your acceptance, should I say. And you consider your place secured once all pending conditions have been satisfied your acceptance form and payment has been received by the UQ, uh, the University of Queensland, and we have issued you your confirmation of enrolment. So really that final step is the key step, which indicates that, you know, acceptance is finalized and your place is secure, is once we've issued you your confirmation of enrolment. Um, so that pretty much is the acceptance process in a nutshell. Um, those are my details, and if you have any other questions, you can uh, understand there's going to be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, but you can also send me an email and I'll get back to you as quickly as possible. Thank you, Chase. And I should have mentioned at the beginning, yes, we'll take questions through the chat function at the end of the presentation. Ah. Yes. So, thank you. Now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rachel to give an overview of UX models. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel and I'm part of the financial aid team that helps um, students uh, with US federal loans. Um, so UQ is accredited to administer US federal loans to US students, obviously. Um, if you'd like to uh, find out more about US federal loans, just a little bit of research by yourself at UQ. Um, I encourage you to get onto UQ's website. Um, and if you just type in US federal loans um, in the search engine, you'll come to this page. And basically it talks about eligibility, um, the step-by-step step -step process at UQ, um, sort of uh, frequently asked questions, those, those types of things. It also has our contact details on that page as well. And what we do is if, you, if we encourage you to email us at that financial aid generic email um, of any questions that you'd like answered. So um, please feel free, um, even if you haven't accepted your offer yet, to email us um, at that email address so that we can um, answer any queries that you might have. So just moving on to the next slide, there's a few points that... Um, I want to briefly talk to you about today. Um, most of you will be familiar with the FAFSAs, um, probably being undergrad students. So your FAFSA is your student aid report, um, which determines your eligibility to US federal loans. 
Um, in addition to that, to that, students are required to complete promissory notes. Um, as a graduate student, you have access to the unsubsidised Stafford loan and a Grad Plus loan. So in order to um, complete your eligibility for US federal loans, um, you're required to, to complete promissory notes, um, which a lot of you will be familiar with anyway. Um, interesting to note is that when you complete your FAFSA, I believe it comes up with a, um, a note to say that the FAFSA has now been sent to your school. Because we're a foreign school, unfortunately FAFSAs aren't sent to UQ. So we have no idea a student is applying for a, for a US loan. So on our website where we have our step-by-step -step process, we have what's called a UQ US loan request form and you'll just see that to the right of your screen. Um, we ask students to complete that form and email it to the financial aid email address. And that basically kick, kicks off uh, the process for UQ and yourselves um, to securing a US federal loan. Um, You'll note on the form that it really, it's just sharing some of your information, your name, your social security number, your UQ student number, your date of birth. Um, we ask a, a few questions about, you know, whether you've got dual citizenship, whether you've secured a scholarship at all um, at UQ, um, what semesters you would like your loans uh, to cover. Um, and because you're a a grad student, um, as I've said, you've got you've got access to the Stafford loan and the Grad Plus loan. So, if wanting the full cost of attendance, the approved full cost of attendance covered, um, you can just tick maximum Stafford and maximum Grad Plus loan. You don't need to know, you know, how much you're borrowing at this point in time because we will never set your loan up above the approved cost of attendance. Um, however, you can nominate amounts on, on that form or you can also tick tuition only if it's only tuition only that you're wanting to cover uh, your US federal loans. Um, for your FAFSA, when you complete your student aid report, please note that UQ's FAFSA code is G10692. That allows us to go into the US loan system and actually pull down your information. Unless you put that on there, we, have, we don't have access to your FAFSA. We also ask students to complete entrance counselling um, at the time that they're completing their promissory notes. You'll only need to do entrance counselling once while you're at UQ. However, your promissory notes, because we're a foreign school, you'll be required to complete those every year. Whereas I think in uh, domestically in the US, I think they last you for about 10 years. Please note that the annual limit for a Stafford loan is 20,500 US dollars. That's your annual limit per year. So for instance, if the cost of attendance is $90,000 for an academic year, we would then supplement with a Grad Plus loan, which is not capped at an annual limit. Um, so just keeping that in mind. I think domestically in the US, if you're doing a medical degree, your Stafford loan is upwards to $40,000. However, that's not applied at a foreign school. So your annual limit for Stafford is 20,500. Moving on to the next slide. Um, I've We've put up um, basically what the approved cost of attendance for an Oshner Year One student um, is currently in 2020. Now this won't um, move too much in that we'll look at the cost of attendance for 2021, sort of in around about October this year, September, October. And generally, if there's any increases, it will be increased by, uh, based on inflation at the time. So what you see is uh, the cost of attendance is those things that we're allowed to include um, in the cost of attendance based on US regulations. So we can each year we can include the premium for OSHC, which is just the cost for one year. The living allowance is based um, in 
Australian dollars, obviously. What we include in there is 38 academic weeks of study plus your compulsory observership. So um, we can only actually include those weeks that you're at, those academic weeks. We can't give you living allowance. It's based on 52 weeks, which is obviously, which is um, a year. Um, we have one-off establishment costs of $3,750, which is basically to assist with those relocation costs of coming to Australia. Then we have tuition, which is charged in US, USD. We can include the disbursement fees, which is what the US government charges you to take out a loan and disbursement of those funds. So we include them there for the simple reason we don't want those fees to basically eat into um, your living allowance. So you'll see that the cost of attendance is just over 98,000 US dollars. Um, obviously, we budget for the full cost of tuition. However, at the, at the point of accepting your offer, you will have paid 3,000 US dollars off, off your tuition for semester one. So if a student is taking out the full cost of attendance, um, that $3,000 in your first disbursement will essentially come back to you along with your stipend. Okay, unless you um, indicate otherwise that you don't want that to come to come back. Okay, now what I want to impress on students is that, that you have total control over your loan. So basically the cost of attendance, the approved cost of attendance is uh, the sum that you can borrow up to. Um, however, you are under no obligation to take out the full cost of attendance. Some students will take out the full cost of attendance and when they receive their award letter, they might decide that they want to take out less. Provided you give us a week's notice prior to that to your semester disbursements, we can change your loan um, to however um, you see fit. So. Um, so that's what I want to impress, is that you have total control over your loan. You don't have to take out the full cost of attendance. We have a lot of students that take out tuition only um, and then decide during the semester that they um, require living allowance. So it's not an issue to arrange another disbursement throughout the semester. Okay, so um, if we can just move on to the next slide. Okay, the other thing that I need to also tell you is that funds aren't dispersed until the first day of class, okay? So, and US regulations prevent us from doing that um, any sooner. So I just, I just wanna let students know, know about that um, beforehand. In order to be eligible for US federal loans too, you need to be enrolled half time and above. So essentially for doctor of medicine, full time would be considered eight units per semester. In order to maintain eligibility to US federal loans, you need to be enrolled uh, four units and above. Uh, the other thing to note is that students must maintain satisfactory academic progression which means that students must maintain an accumulated GPA of 4.25. Now, for a first year student, we wouldn't look at your accumulated GPA until you'd had, you have a full academic year under your belt. Once you move into the latter years of um, your program, we check students' GPAs um, every semester to see whether um, they're meeting academic progress. Um, for students that aren't meeting academic process um, progress, we've got some, um, we have a policy in place that we apply to US federal loan students, um, which you can find on our US uh, federal loan website, on the UQ website, that, that goes into more detail about that. Um, but if a student's not maintaining academic progress, the financial aid team, we'll contact that student and we'll talk you through that process. So basically you will lose eligibility um, 
momentarily until such time we can place you on probation. Okay, so we'll go into a little bit more of that when you um, come here, if you accept your offer and you come here during orientation week where I do a presentation. So we'll go into a little bit more detail then. So nothing for you to be concerned at, at the moment, but it, you just need to keep that in mind that um, your eligibility basically um, hinges on maintaining that accumulated GPA. Um, and that accumulated GPA is higher than UQ's uh, pass rate of a four. So also keep that in mind. In terms of um, your living allowances and other items that we can disperse to your bank account, we can disperse funds to either an Australian or a US bank account. Um, so, you know, you don't have to, when you come to Australia, you don't have to rush out and, and get an Australian bank account. Typically, uh, we have students that have both. There's a tendency for first and second year students to perhaps have an Australian bank account because they find um, it's easier. They've got a branch that they can go into. They've got more ATM access or they might not be getting charged for ATM withdrawals. Um, however, we encourage students to do their own research um, and we can't really counsel you on what's best, whether it's an Australian or a US bank account. Um, some students start off with the US bank account for their first disbursement. However, they find that um, just through ease, they open up an Australian bank account leading into semester two. Provided you give us a week's notice, we can change um, your bank account details and um, based on what account you nominate. Um, for any student that may be ineligible for US loans or they lose their eligibility, which may be for a number of um, reasons, namely their GPA or their half, less than half time enrolment, um, students may qualify for a Sally May private loan. So that's something also to remember. Sally May is the only lender, private lender, which lends to students who are studying um, in a foreign school. So, you know, if sh should that happen to, to a student, we would encourage the student to contact us um, as soon as possible, just so that we can um, provide a little bit of advice around that. Um, next slide. Rachel, just before we move on, I, I might clarify that UQ's rating scale, like our temperatures or Celsius here, our rating scale is also different. So UQ has a rating scale of sections as being the top mark. So we're not expecting you to maintain a 4.25 GPA on the scale, but a 4.25 GPA on the second scale. Okay. So that's it. But I encourage you to um, take the opportunity to ask questions now, or if you think of something later, just send us an email to financialaid at uq.edu.au and we'll be more than happy to uh, answer your query. Thank you, Rachel and Chase. And before we go to questions, I just want to um, alert students. Some of you may have already taken advantage of the opportunity to book a of online chat with either a member of the Oshner and the enrollment team or a current UQ Oshner medical student. That opportunity continues to be available to you. So if you want to chat to someone specifically about your offer letter, or perhaps you want to you know, talk to a year one student to you know, get some information from them about what first year is really like, we have that opportunity as well. So please feel free to reach out to us if you want to continue um, in conversation with either, as I said, a member of the enrollment team or a current student. We'll just go to the questions now. So um, I failed to introduce another colleague who's also joining us on this webinar, Shalyn and Hilton Sinclair. So some of you may have already been in contact with Shalyn because she assists with um, the applications and the inquiries that, that come in. So um, she's here to supplement Chase and Rachel's expertise and knowledge. Um, we'll go to the questions here. Um, so Brian's already confirmed the figures that Rachel put up in terms of total cost of attendance. That final number, Rachel has confirmed that it is in US dollars. Okay. 
We have another question asking about the update on COVID-19 in Australia and what happens if we cannot enter Australia. I'm happy to field this one and then please, any of my fellow panelists, um, please chime in. So um, we've been very fortunate in Australia that our, the number of cases of COVID-19 and, and any deaths resulting, resulting from COVID-19 have been quite low, particularly in comparison to the U.S. Now that is partly um, a reflection of obviously our smaller population, um, there's about 26 million Australians. Um, we are an island nation, so we were able to enforce border control much more quickly than say um, the U.S. The federal government has released a uh, three-stage roadmap to releasing um, restrictions around uh, movement and you know the lockdown, so to speak. So we are in stage one. Stage two is imminent. The University of Queensland has also released a, a roadmap. So we are in actually the middle of our school year with semester two at the university due to commence in a few weeks. And so semester two for us here will be a combination of online and on campus um, classes. And so our expectation is that by 2021, we will be in a position to offer all online classes. The federal government's roadmap stage three includes um, a, what we're calling a travel bubble. And so that would include travelers from New Zealand, some of our Pacific Islands neighbors and international students. So please keep in touch with us. As we get more information, the, the university is obviously taking direction from the Australian government at the moment. So as we get more information on that, um, we'll, we'll provide that information to our incoming students. I have a question here about scholarships. Rachel, I might refer that one to you. You did mention about scholarship for sponsored students. Do you want to take that question? Rachel, you're on mute, please, if you get on mute. Um, I would encourage students to contact the scholarships team. Um, they have a specific email address, which is sponsored.students at uq.edu.au. In terms of financial aid, we, if, if a student secures a scholarship, we just need to know about it because we have to adjust your loans um, based on taking into account the scholarship that you might be receiving. But um, by all means, reach out to the scholarships team and see if there is anything on offer. Thank you. Next question is a student asking, I heard something about the program changing effect of 2022. Could you speak more to that? So um, the, the major change that will be happening in 2022 is the introduction of subject prerequisites. So as you would be aware, in applying for the 2021 intake, our entry requirements are GPA, MCAT, and from that you were, you were then invited to attend the MMI and then ranked on, on all of those three criteria. From, from next year, students applying for the 2022 intake will be required to um, meet the subject prerequisites, uh, systems physiology and cell and tissue biology. So we're currently working through um, or, or equivalent. So we have courses at UQ that we will measure um, what courses you've done in those areas against. And so in the next few months, we'll, we'll make sure we have more information available on our website. Another question for you, Rachel. Does the cost of attendance change once students return to the US for phase two? Yes, yeah, so the cost of attendance changes for every year that um, the student goes through the program. Um, in particular, um, for phase two, things like uh, USMLE uh, step two program um, is included, residency applications, uh, travel for residency interviews. There's a number of items that, that are included in the cost of attendance. So, uh, and we also put that together along with the OSHNA uh, team in the US, so they have, uh, they're consulted and have input to make sure that we're meeting, I suppose, the best needs of the students that are in the US at the time. So, um, yeah, changes every year. And Rachel, I, I have another question about cost breakdown, if I can give that one to you. Does the living allowance include rent, food, transport, etc.? Yes, yes, all of it, all of it. Great, thank you. 
case we have an OSHC question, so I'll throw that to you as the expert in OSHC. What are the OSHC coverage dates if we go with the UQ plan? What are the dates if I want to undertake my own plan? Okay, so the UQ will set up a um, coverage start date from the 14th of January 2021 for this intake. Um, and the policy duration will be 51 months. Uh, and this is just a requirement of any students who are studying in Australia um, that they have cover that covers nominally the full duration of the program they're studying. So the coverage date would start on the 14th of January and the coverage end date would finish on the 13th of April. And if you were to arrange your own overseas health cover, you'd essentially have to mirror that um, because there is a requirement for you to have overseas health cover a certain period before uh, actual program commencement to allow for, you know, an expected time for you to arrive and, you know, commence living in Brisbane shortly before you commence your studies um, until the end of the program. Now, once you complete your UQ portion of study and return back to complete your, your rest of the program in the US, you can contact Allianz if you're arranging it through us directly uh, or your provider um, to request that a refund of that, you know, the part of the, pro, of the overseas health cover that you're no longer going to use at that stage. Um, but at least while you're applying for, to, um, to come to Australia and studying in Australia, you'll have to have overseas health cover that covers the full duration, essentially, of your student visa. Thank you. We have a couple more questions about OSHC, Chase, so I'll direct these to you. Do you recommend using the provided health insurance package or finding another one? Um, so your offer letter will include some details about approved providers. So there are, I think, three providers that we will accept overseas health cover um, policies from. Uh, there are some benefits to arranging your overseas health cover through UQ, through Allianz. Um, if you do opt to do that through us, the Allianz, um, I guess the policy that we can provide, doesn't include wait times that you might find with other um, policy providers for things like mental health, um, and I think also perhaps pregnancy. Um, obviously we don't see that one used too much, but those are, you know, I guess two advantages advantages of um, arranging overseas health cover through UQ, um, therefore through Allianz. Thank you. Another question about OSHC, is it possible to delay payment proof of OSHC coverage past the 21 day acceptance window while securing a spot in a uh, yes, so basically that 21 day date is the date for you to submit your acceptance of the offer, um, but your, that acceptance won't be fully processed until we receive that overseas health cover evidence. So really, I guess the critical deadline um, for that is when you submit your payment details, you should also be submitting your overseas health cover requirements or your evidence of having arranged another acceptable policy. Um, question about um, offers being rescinded. Once you accept the offer and you receive the confirmation of enrollment, is there anything that could cause that offer to be rescinded? And I open it up to any of our panelists. Shalini, if you have some information you wanted to share. Um, I'll, I'll just jump in quickly. From an admissions point of view, that would be very, very unusual. Um, it would mean that something has come up, some sort of evidence has come up um, after our full assessment. At a very late stage to indicate that the information provided at the application stage is not correct or not complete or you know there was an issue there that and that that meant that you no longer actually satisfied the requirements for entry to the program other than that from an from an admissions perspective um there, there really wouldn't be many um instances where an offer would be rescinded thank you um, the students asking who they should contact for questions regarding Visa applications and visas for partners? Um, well, I guess part of the application process when you do arrange your overseas health cover is to advise what type of cover that you require. So if you do choose to arrange cover through UQ, we'll ask you to confirm whether you want single cover for you know, an individual, um, couples cover if you're coming with a partner, or family cover, um, depending on your situation. So that's probably the aspect of that that you can ask um, UQ about. But as far as admissions goes on that, we only issue a confirmation of enrollment um, 
directly to the respective student. Any other questions, I suppose, about visa applications, um, probably best directed towards the Department of Home Affairs because they'll have the most current information and be able to you know, speak to your situation in a bit more detail than what we perhaps can. Thank you. I think this is going to be a shallow question. It's about the residency match. So um, how does a residency match in the US occur after graduation in November of 2024? From what I know, the residency match begins in March and there seems to be lag time between graduating and matching with the residency program. How will this whole process work? Yep, so not a problem. I can um, provide a little bit of detail on that. So um, the, the team actually based at Oshner, the student affairs team, supports all Oshner students with all of their match applications, um, practice interviews, um, letters of recommendation, and anything you might need towards your match application. So year four students will end their placements um, around November with the graduation being December. So you actually have quite a few months um, compared to your US medical student counterparts where you can attend interviews, whether that be online for the time being or in person um, with the match actually occurring in March. So you actually have a few months where your um, program has been completed before um, before the match where you can take more time to dedicate to the application process compared to um, the students in, in US medical schools. The, the big kind of, I think, um, benefit to that is that you would have completed all of your year four placements so you can speak to those during interviews, whereas um, students in US medical schools would only have completed half um, half of their um, their final year placements um, by the time they would um, apply, apply for their program. So there is a bit of time. The match does occur in March with most residency programs beginning in July. So we find a lot of our students um, undertake research or travel for six months. Um, so they Thank you, Shalyn. And I, I encourage you um, on our website, we have recordings of previous webinars and some of our Oshner colleagues presented several weeks ago about the support that we offer for USMLE and residency applications. So I encourage you to, to review that webinar and, and hopefully get more information. We've got a question now about um, the deposit transfer, banks processing time. As Chase said, our 21 day deadline for acceptance because of the current situation around the world with the global pandemic, we are prepared to be flexible. So simply keep in touch with us if you need more than 21 days to submit your deposit in order to secure your place. And you know, depending on the circumstances, we will be prepared to be flexible about that deadline. Just keep in touch with us, letting us know that you're going to need a little bit longer to arrange the, the deposit. Chase, we're going to come back to you with more OSHC questions. Does the OSHC cover over the first two years, or does that extend into the last two years when you're in Louisiana? Um, I think it's the full duration. So the, the end date of that policy that we set up all those dates is um, 13th of April, 2025. However, it does not cover you when you are in the U.S. And I'm not sure if you have more information about the um, uh, healthcare coverage that they would need to arrange for when they're in New Orleans. So I don't have the, the specifics on, on what that is, but there will have to be evidence of um, whatever kind of US based insurance you have before starting year three in New Orleans. But as Chase mentioned before, um, while your overseas student health cover um, for your Australian based program, last the four years, you are entitled to apply for a refund for those two years that you spent um, back in, in New Orleans. So that happens um, uh, kind of towards the end of your program when you can apply for a refund for those other two years. It's just a kind of a requirement for, um, for the visa that you have um, coverage for the entire duration of, of the four year program. Thank you. Um, Chase, a student's asking about who they can contact with regards to OSAC. Um, she's been research, researching pre-existing conditions and has questions about how to, how to access medications. 
Trace, you're muted. I think um, one of the good things about Allianz, and it's probably just we're aware of it because we deal with them, is that they have a really good student um, sort of uh, platform. So once you do have access, they do make it very, very, or provide really good advice. It's easy to navigate about how to access Australian medical services, including medication um, and things like that. So I think that would probably be the first place to go. Um, but then, you know, if you have any questions once you're on shore, um, generally speaking, our, we have a student centre that's very, very um, good at responding to all sorts of queries to do with, you know, student life, including things like that. So there's a lot of support services available on faculty and on campus and a lot of places that you can, you know, ask those questions to. Um, but I, I've sort of had a good look at the Allianz um, platform and I think it, it, it really does do a good job of making students aware not only of how to um, access medical services, but also, you know, what you can get and you know just advice about staying healthy as an international student in Australia. We also have another question if they are not getting um, OSH3, OSHC through UQ, how do they, when they submit the payment form, how do they confirm that they have uh, paid for OSHC through another provider? So you just have to provide the policy. Um, with the details of the coverage um, and the, the period in there. So that should all be standard in any policy details that you have. Um, and just ensuring that you refer to the offer letter to make sure that you're arranging your policy to one of the approved providers. So there are, there are a lot of providers out there that provide overseas health cover, um, but we're not able to accept a policy from just anyone. It has to be one of those listed as approved in your offer letter. Thank you. Um, a student's asking if anyone has used TransferWise and how do they ensure that the deposit is received and sent in US dollars? Sorry, can I um, hear that? I think I just lost you for a little bit there. So if the question is, has anyone used TransferWise and how do they ensure that the deposit is received and sent in US dollars? Um, I'm not actually sure if anyone has. Um, <coughs> I'm not familiar with TransferWise. Um, generally, people pay by credit card or by you know telegraphic transfer. Um, and generally speaking, if you're paying by telegraphic transfer, you know it'll note the amount paid and um, you know the currency was paid in, and we can use that to locate a payment uh, in our finance system. Um, I think you know credit card details. We obviously process that on our end, so it's quite straightforward. Um, but if, the, if anyone else on the panel has any information about TransferWise, I'd be happy to refer to them. Um, if you do want to pay that way and you have any questions about that, um, you can always forward us a query to application status, the email address that was provided earlier, and then we can um, ask our finance team to have a, have a look at it because you know, we do receive a wide variety of payments, and even if we haven't used a certain system before, there may be you know, a, a way that we can, so we'll accommodate as much as we can. Thank you. Sean, we've got a question about the first stage uh, certificate requirement. And the student's saying, if I'm a certified EMT in the US that expires in 2022, does that qualify? Does that meet the, the requirement? Sean, you're muted. Cecile, I'm just double checking um, uh, on this one. So if we can hold this over for another question or two's time, and then I'll get back to you. I'm asking if there's going to be an opportunity to get in contact with other individuals accepted into the program, for example, to try to arrange a living situation with roommates. Yes, so we were before this webinar, we were talking to our colleagues at Oshner, and we're working with the uh, current Oshner Medical Student Leadership Group. We will be setting up a Facebook page next month, and we will um, issue that, that a link to that Facebook page to all of the um, students who have received and accepted an offer and you'll be able to connect through your um, other first year classmates through that Facebook page. Um, a question here about the criminal history check. Can the presence of anything on the criminal history check affect the acceptance? Yes, um, so please don't you know, uh, be alarmed at the requirement to have a criminal history check. This is a fairly standard process. Um, where your acceptance might be impacted, if there is anything that will preclude you from achieving registration as a physician post the program. 
program, that would be something that would need to be taken into consideration. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's fairly a fairly straightforward request for information. Again, if you have more specific questions, if you wanted to, you know, really clarify some details around that, please feel free to send us an email and we can follow up that clearly. Um, Rachel, I think this is a specific question for you. What does the SSAF fee include? So that, um, that's the student amenities fee, isn't it? Yes. That UQ charges, um, it's something that all students um, are charged um, at UQ. I mean, it's really probably a question for fees themselves. Um, but I think it's so that you have access to all the services that are on campus. It helps to subsidise things like the on-campus athletic facilities, you know, the eateries and so on. So you're exactly right. And all students, international and external students are required to pay that fee. Um, a student is asking about breakdowns or total cost of attendance for phase two, but I think Rachel, you spoke about that earlier. And obviously more information would be provided to students when they're in the program as that amount will vary each year depending on you know, inflation and so on. Yeah, so when we send out, so students have to apply for US loans every academic year. So if you're coming into 2021, we would ask you to get in touch with us around September of this year. And because we will have um, set the cost of attendance for 2021. Um, when we set up your uh, loans and we send you an award letter, we also send you each year a copy that breakdown of your cost of attendance. So depending on what you, year you're going into, you will receive a breakdown um, of the cost of attendance, you know, be it you're in third or fourth year in New Orleans. Um, we think this is a good way of you know, uh, assisting students in budgeting. Now the approved, what I probably should have said earlier was the, the approved cost of attendance um, is put together by ourselves with input from other people and it's actually audited each year as well. So um, the only time a student may be able to increase their loan above the cost of attendance are for um, things like childcare. So if you're a student that's um, coming to Australia and bringing your family, if you've got uh, children in childcare, we are able to increase your cost of attendance based on those childcare expenses um, for those academic weeks that you're studying. Um, other things might include uh, dental or medical expenses that aren't covered by OSHC. And then in other instances, it may be extraordinary circumstances that we might be able to increase your cost of attendance. And if that applies to any students throughout the year, we would encourage them to get in contact with us so we can work through um, any of those issues. Uh, but prior, obviously, um, if you have got uh, if you have got child children that you're bringing to 2021. Um, into Australia, please contact us and we'll talk you to that process because we can include that, increase your cost of attendance uh, for, the full, for the full academic year um, and work that into your award letter. Thank you. Chase, we have a question about uh, a refund of the deposit. So if we have to cancel the acceptance offer post-submission due to unforeseen circumstances, would we be refunded the deposit and OSHC amount? Um, okay, so there's two answers to that. The first would be overseas health cover. So we arranged that on the student's behalf through Allianz, um, but after that point, the relationship is between students and Allianz. So you can contact Allianz to request a refund if you're not going to use the policy anymore. Um, for the refund of the deposit, there will be a um, section in your offer letter that details the process for requesting a refund. Um, the timelines for when to do that and, um, you know, what basis that we can refund um, a deposit on. So um, I encourage you to have a look at that because quite often, depending on the duration or how long before um, your commencement that you request, the refund will depend on whether or not you're eligible, eligible for a refund and how much of that refund you'll be eligible for.
Thank you. We have a student asking how early should I start looking for apartments, roommates? Well, first of all, I will give you another Australian tip. So we don't use the term roommates in Australia. We talk about flatmates or housemates. So flat is what, how we refer to apartments or units. Um, I would suggest, you know, once the Facebook page is set up next month, that's really going to be the opportunity to connect with your fellow first year students. Till then, you can have a look at the UQ website. We have quite a, a well-developed support services um, website that talks about the accommodation options around the main UQ campus at St. Lucia. Um, so feel free to do some, some research around some of those options. And then, as I said, when, when the Facebook page is available, you can talk to your, your other incoming classmates about accommodation options. Um, there's another question here about scholarships. What scholarships are available to apply to? Are they merit-based or need-based? And is completing the FAFSA required if I do not plan on applying for loans? I'll just talk about the scholarships first and then refer the FAFSA query to Rachel. So just bear, be aware that there is no institutional financial aid, as I know is very common at most U.S. Um, universities and medical schools. Um, the, the Australian government requires all international students to Australia to pay full fees. So that is the, the full fee of the cost of, of um, providing that program. So um, any scholarships that would be available would tend to be um, either from a, a sponsorship organization um, in the U.S. Or if you, you know, are eligible for a research scholarship, that, that might be an option as well. Um, Rachel, the, the FAFSA question was, is completing the FAFSA required if I do not plan on applying for loan? No. No. So if you're not intending to um, access US federal loans, there's no need to complete a FAFSA. Thank and FAFSA is like promissory notes have to be completed every year, every award year. Thank you. So that's the end of the chat questions. Shalyn, did you have anything you wanted to add to that previous question? Yep, so I just sent that student um, the link to the requirement. I'll just um, kind of highlight too, just in, in regard to the apartment and roommate question. Um, there's, we have, in, in Australia, we have um, a, a website similar to Craigslist where a lot of our students um, kind of find rooms or houses to live in called Gumtree. Now, I mean, that's something that a lot of our students um, kind of look at before they arrive, but we do kind of suggest um, not um, signing leases or paying deposits for anything until they've actually seen something in person. So it may be that um, before they arrive in Australia, they find kind of short-term accommodation, um, get, get to Brisbane, and then um, actually go and look at apartments or houses um, and see them in person because uh, as probably everybody knows, um, things in pictures look a lot different um, and meeting a landlord is a lot different um, in person than, than um, online or, um, or kind of um, via, via email or text. Thank you, Shalyn. And I've also just been reminded, we will be holding a, a webinar in July that will focus on living in Brisbane. So we'll bring you more information, you know, about the city, about things like public transit, or accommodation options and so on. So, you know, please feel free to join us then. Um, and after you have a look at the website, Gumtree that Shalyn's mentioned, and we'll be able to provide more information there. Thank you very much to everyone who's attended the webinar today. And I want to say very special thank you to our, our presenters, Chase Hardy, Rachel Keogh, and thank you, Shalyn, as well, for joining us to answer some more questions. We look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you to Australia. Thank you. Bye-bye.